You're listening to the Native Plants Healthy Planet Podcast, presented by Pinelands Nursery. Here are your hosts, Fran Chismar and Tom Knezic. I am very proud of the diversity of this show. Welcome back to the Native Plants Healthy Planet podcast presented by Pinelands Nursery. I am Fran Chismar. And I'm Tom Knezic. And Fran, I agree with you. I'm, we've really managed to have a well-rounded group of guests on this show covering various opinions on a huge number of topics. Um, and we're planning on continuing that. So um, in one way we've expanded the show is we're really proud to announce that we've started a Native Plant Healthy Planet Facebook group. Um, and this is a way we, we started to brainstorm of a way that we could get folks to interact with not just us, but guests and kind of have a pre-show discussion, post-show discussion. Give your thoughts on an episode. I've found in a, as a podcast consumer, well, sometimes it's hard to get in touch with the hosts or, or the guests of the show after that show. you Something might have sparked your interest and you said, hey, you know, I really want to give my feedback on this. And Sometimes it's not that easy to, to get in touch with hosts or guests, and sometimes when you do get in touch with them, they don't respond back to you. So we wanted to create a space for, for that to happen. And and I want it to be interactive, and I know you do too, and we were really excited to have it being interactive. That being said, I was really hesitant. <laughs> After we, we we discussed having a Facebook group, I was I was really hesitant to do it, and, and that was partly because – after reading comments in other groups on Facebook this past weekend, uh, other pollinator groups or native plant groups, and, and I, I'm sorry if, if I'm soapboxing here. I, <laughs> I apologize, but I, I just want to reiterate, if you're joining the group, you'll see a set of rules that we ask you to read before you accept, and uh, we're not going to tolerate any bullying or any bashing in this group. Uh, there is room for all educated opinion, opinions. Um, on these topics and and we don't want to uh, see fact replaced by passion <laughs> yeah, yeah <that's laughs> we love it. it could be passion but you know we we want it to be science-based or facts based so um, there's room for all educated opinions on all topics and we want to encourage open discussion we just don't want the finger pointing or the nastiness so if you're willing to open your minds and being willing be a willing participant to all sides of the conversation. I really, I really think with with our guests being members and and who's already a member, this can be one of the most compelling native plant groups on Facebook. Uh, but I just want to reiterate, and I think it's it was best said by Tom Segura in his late latest Netflix special. I think you have a right to be offended by whatever offends you, and I think you have a right to express it. I do not think, however, you have the right to expect anyone to do anything about it. (laughs) Fran, I really agree with you 100%, and that's one of the reasons we put these rules in place so that it's it's related to the guests we had on the podcast, and um, and it's a a scientific-based discussion. It's not necessarily, oh, well, I don't like this, so no one should be able to do it. We want it to be an, an educated conversation, uh, with both guests and, and listeners, um, and really open it up. And, uh, I'm kind of get disheartened when I look at some of these other groups, cause I'm, I try and be active in a lot of these native plant groups and monarch groups. And, um, I think the conversations that we're bringing through this podcast are really beneficial. So I try and share those with those groups. And I, I really didn't like the response I got, uh, in, in some of those conversations. And it's, um, Native plant enthusiasts really have a lot to bring to the table right now. It's uh, we're showing with with just we're losing so much habitat, and native plants are a way to give back that habitat. Have a, a huge amount of environmental benefits and, and ecological benefits that they offer, and how we're acting primarily online is we're really blowing it. We're kind of chasing people away by by how we're acting and, and calling people stupid and idiotic and saying, yo, you'll never believe what my idiot neighbor did. And that's just not the right way to go about it. We need to be inviting and bring people into the space and tie it into their passions. Uh, they might not care as much about monarchs or insects or bees as, or, or, or animals and birds as you do, but tie it into something that they do. And um, we don't need a bunch of uh, people who read one article about Doug Talmy and become an arrogant know-it-all online. We need someone who's who's willing to 
take what and I think Doug is a great example of how to do this. He's taking his ideas and the science that he's he's really developed and then inviting people to join into that and saying this is why it's important. Here's a way that you can become a part of it, not saying Hey, if you're not doing this, you're the dumbest person on the yeah, planet. You're and part you should, of the problem. <laughs> you should yeah, go it's... someplace. <laughs> you should go run off a bridge. Um, and and I and I I would love to say that you're exaggerating, but you're not exaggerating. No, no and but... I I bring up some of the stuff I see in these groups in the office here, and um, I guess what really pained me is the last time I shared the episode with uh with Marcus Gray and how he's creating pollinator or monarch habitat on a lot of golf courses, and um, shared it in some monarch groups and. Marcus is probably one of the more educated people that I've met. He every Me question well. we threw at him, he had knew the answer and had could give historical at, <laughs> analogies of where at, it was used elsewhere. Listen, at, at some point with Marcus, I was just trying to stump him. Yeah. <laughs> like I was yeah. like, yeah. I gotta know, like I have to have a leg up on this guy somewhere, you know. And at whatever I mentioned, not only could he talk intelligent intelligently mm-hmm. about it, ec- expand on it. So. Yes, and. So that was why it kind of was hurtful to me when I shared this with some of these monarch groups, and they didn't really receive. I'm sure plenty of people received it, but some of the people who left comments didn't receive it so well and said how they hated golf and and golf courses were doing nothing but poisoning the environment. And it was evident they didn't listen to the podcast yes. and listen to the yeah. conversation. And uh, and it was actually funny because Marcus then saw that I was tagging him in some of these comments I was leaving in response to what people were saying and. He uh, he told me that he was actually banned from the one, the one Facebook group because uh, they did not like what he was doing. And I've I've known Marcus for I guess about two years now, uh, mostly through through email and phone calls. But you can tell he's just really passionate about monarch butterflies. He knows how the environment works, and he's kind of leveraged his platform to into something that's creating thousands of acres of habitat and has the potential to create tens of thousands of acres of habitat. And he's being told he's doing it the wrong way by people who are really uh, saving a couple caterpillars at a time and complaining online about their crazy neighbors. And I even read something about a, a <laughs> prolapsed rectum <laughs> of the monarch caterpillar. But those discussions are okay. Just, yeah, that was okay. But someone who's doing something really great was not. And it makes me feel like I'm taking crazy pills sometimes when I read this stuff no, that, and, that this and, is and, out you know, there. Marcus is someone that, you know, he's not converting people by preaching at them. Yeah. He's yeah. giving them the opportunity to see the benefits, and he's letting people convert themselves to a way of thinking that is more sustainable for land ethics and ecology as a whole. And he was completely banned by people that just, you know, golf courses use chemicals. Horrible idea. They'll kill mm-hmm. all the the monarchs. Mm-hmm. So you're not you didn't help at all, yeah. which. They didn't hear any of the conversation. They didn't even listen. So so that's it for me. Rant over. The main thing we found through just about every single one of these discussions, whether it comes to water quality or, or bees or butterflies or birds, it it's really comes down to one thing, and that's loss of habitat. They're just we're losing habitat. And, and, and you know, every every episode I'm completely surprised when you you <laughs> offer me a final thought of the day. So I I I purposely now I know you can never per, you know exactly know what you're going to say because you don't know what the conversations are going to be. But I'm like, man, if he asked me, you know, I have loss a good idea. That's going to be a trend with <laughs> this one. Too. <laughs> loss of habitat is going to be my final thought today. But so we'll we'll definitely are going to revisit that at at the end of the show or before we leave the show today. So and but Tom, I completely agree with you. I I think we have people that are interested into what is good, what is going on in good land ethics um, and good ecology. And they want to be educated, and it's met with people uh, that mistake passion for for knowledge and talk down and, and bully. Mm-hmm. And, and so we, we encourage you to join the group, but mm-hmm. leave that stuff at home. Yes. If you're yes. if you're one of those people, figure it out. Don't bring it to yeah, our group. Exactly. <laughs> and I, and I feel even today's topic. You know, it's it's funny that we're pre- we're we're prefacing this because I feel today's topic could be considered controversial to to some of our mm-hmm. listeners. So. I thought it would be um, a really good idea for you and I to both share our general views on hunting, even though this isn't necessarily about hunting, um, mm-hmm. but it, it, it could contain hunting. So I, I thought maybe you and I could could both give our views before we introduce the guests. So mm-hmm. I am not a hunter, but I'm not against hunting. So I believe if you're a hunter in the USA and you adhere to all the rules and laws, you have every right to hunt. Um, I am. I believe in balance, and I think it's inherent. You know, animals hunt other animals. 
for food. And I think that's inherent in who we are. And I don't think you should completely deny that. You know, I'm, I'm totally uh, – personally, I might hunt if I was going to eat what I hunted. Mm-hmm. Now, I'm not going to eat – I'm not a fan of venison or, or things like that. So that's why I don't hunt. It's – you know, I grew up in an area where no one was hunters. It was mm-hmm. more suburban and urban. Um, but I would definitely eat turkey. I would – I could see yeah. myself hunting, <laughs> you know, turkey hunting because I love turkey. But um, – and I just learned, speaking of which, I just learned I didn't know this, that a group of turkey is called a rafter. And I didn't know that either. I, I didn't know that. So I, I learned yeah. something new just prepping for today. So now, Tom, you are a hunter. Mm-hmm. So what are your beliefs? Um, I could get a little long-winded here, and I probably will. <laughs> That's okay. That's okay. <laughs> but, That's okay. But uh, I really think that, that hunting overall has kind of gotten a bad rapport with people. It's it's really portrayed pretty poorly in the media um in movies cartoons tv you see hunters portrayed often as blubbering idiots and uh toothless rednecks and you think of deliverance and elmer fudd and and people who probably don't have it all together and haven't visited a dentist in a while <laughs> and and but that's that's how it's portrayed a lot yeah and time. really there there is some of that when it comes to hunting and uh a good example is what happened in pennsylvania with uh two teenage deer hunters and how they kind of uh, maimed a deer and then tortured it a little bit and, and they're being punished for that and the hunting community overall doesn't agree with what they did and um, it really doesn't represent hunting as a whole and for every nimrod that you have with a shotgun there's a, there's folks like Dr. Bracey Hill out of Baylor University who's who specialized in history and religion and actually wrote a book about hunting in the Bible um, you have Dr. James Tantillo who's an environmental philosopher and ethicist at Cornell and uh, really goes into depth about how we treat the environment and, and draws on folks like Aldo Leopold and Teddy Roosevelt and all these uh, people who've had that that environmental ethic ingrained and have their own opinion and helps divulge what people should maybe take into account there. You have uh, Steve Rinella, um, who's probably on the forefront of this um, uh, hunt to eat mission right now. And he's an, he's an author and conservationist, and he's leading the charge of, of new wave uh, a new wave of outdoorsmen and women and um it's a way like he's really embracing that it's a way to source clean protein for for your family it's a way to connect with the outdoors and not just take away from the outdoors but also give back and and become part of it it's, and and i think that's another common theme is like we're not above nature mm-hmm. we're part of nature yeah. and it's mm-hmm. interaction with that and understanding and mm-hmm. that's i like that that movement is moving to more towards yeah that. yeah and and for anyone who's interested in hunting not just because they want to start hunting but just wants to to learn a little bit more about why people hunt and and i guess the reasoning behind it uh check out his series and his i guess his whole internet platform he has the meat eater website there's a meat eater tv show on on netflix um he has a whole podcast series which he's interviewing some of the the best and brightest in the wildlife world and um not just hunters but but all sorts of people um so if you're interested interested in learning more about that that's someone to definitely check out uh my personal experience with hunting um i feel like you're not so much observing nature you're you become a part of it you become of that life cycle nature can be a really cruel space and there's a lot of death and people well, not just people but animals are, are hunting to eat that's yeah. a way they need to survive and it's not something you're going to take away so when you go out hunting you become a part of it and not just in the sense that you're taking but you're also observing different birds and foxes and raccoons and uh if i'm deer hunting well you'll see turkeys come through and you're observing everything that's going on you kind of become more in tune you're not just looking for one thing you're you're become a part of it it's it's really interesting and when it when it really comes down you're out there to harvest an animal so that you can bring it back to your family to eat it and um it's not just as simple as that. You really put a lot into it. You put a lot of practice because you want to make sure that you're not causing any suffering to that animal. So it's um, my least favorite part I found is actually the shot. It's uh, I'm, I love the beginning part. I love putting in all the time, just finding where a deer or a turkey might yeah. be. Um, and then I love the actual the, the uh, harvest of the animal when you have it and you're you're actually cherishing all the different cuts of meat and preparing it for well in my case my my family my Mm -hmm. wife and and uh and my parents and brother 
and friends, and you kind of relive that whole moment every time uh, you eat it or look at the trophy. It's, it's a, uh, I don't want to call it an out of body yeah. experience, but it's almost a surreal experience, and it's something that lives on inside you, and it's something that would have happened if you if you were to Steve Rennell actually puts it really well. If you were to completely wipe away the world and start over and hit refresh, I'm pretty sure it would happen. Hunting wouldn't it would be. Happen. Or I'm almost positive hunting is one of those things that wouldn't would happen again some of the a lot of the other things the wars that kind of stuff it might not happen again hunting would definitely happen it's more primal it's yeah it's more primal you you do it to eat it's not Mm -hmm. yeah you know it's it's not well thought out malice Mm -hmm. you know it's and uh it's a shame that it's become somewhat controversial today but i i agree it's uh anyway transitioning into today's guest um we mentioned before at the nursery we get to work with a lot of really cool groups uh, many of those projects actually have hunting-focused groups as a partner in the restoration. Uh, groups like Ducks Unlimited or Trout Unlimited um, or National Wild Turkey Federation like we have on today. So that was one of the things we wanted to do when we set out to do this podcast. It was not just have people who like butterflies or birds or bees. We wanted to have the whole spectrum here because together they're all working towards not just similar goals but oftentimes the same goals. And, and, uh, and we wanted to have the full spectrum whether yeah. we agreed or not. Yeah. And, and fortunately, so far, we've we've agreed, mm-hmm. you know, but, you know, we're not afraid to, if it gets to a point, to bring a perspective on that's that's against our personal beliefs. That's not a problem because yeah. it's it's a balance of, of, of letting them be heard also and, and maybe giving them the opportunity to convert us. Yeah. yeah. But so without – rambling on too much longer this took a little bit longer wow than we it really usually did. did this is like our but, biggest um, preamble ever but it's right now it's turkey season in new jersey they're out there if you're driving down the road and you're you're looking in field edges you might see that big puffed up bird with a, a fan off the back that could be gobbling its head off so that's why we want to start in the hunting sector with the national wild turkey federation so uh today we actually have uh, the president of the new jersey chapter of the the national wild Tur- or national Wild Turkey Federation. Uh, Lou, why don't you take a second to introduce yourself? I sure will. My name is uh, Lou Gambali, and uh, I want to commend you guys. I, I, I just uh, I thoroughly just enjoyed your both your perspectives. Thank you. On, yeah, on, thank on you. Honey. Honey. I thought that was uh, well thought out and well articulated. I, I, it's great to always to hear other folks' uh, perspectives, and especially considering one being a hunter and one not so mm-hmm. yeah and, I, I, and, I commend you for that and, and we're looking forward to hearing your perspective too mm-hmm. and that's oh for sure yeah. well you know I, I am the president of a state chapter uh here in new jersey and um you know I, I i mean for me you know i've been with the the organization now about 22 years and i've been you know i'm 64 now i've been hunting since i was 14 years old oh, so okay. I got involved with the Turkey Federation a little later in my hunting career. I wish I had done it a lot earlier, but as you guys probably know, we didn't even have turkeys in yeah. New Jersey yeah. until almost really the latter part of the 70s in North Jersey mm-hmm. and then down here in South Jersey, even well into the 80s. So um, so for me, I'm, I'm, I'm proud and grateful that, that, that I was able to find my way to the National Wild Turkey Federation mm-hmm. as uh, absolutely enhanced my soul and given me a an additional platform to uh to 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 go forth and support the what you know causes that i so much believe in Mm -hmm. yeah i i you know it's funny i i see wild turkey almost every day just you know whether it be in my property or coming to work i don't think i saw my first wild turkey till probably 2000 and it was I just moved to New Jersey. I was working at Princeton Nurseries at, in Allentown, New Jersey, and I, I was amazed just seeing a, a rafter of of turkey come by. And I I never thought I would ever see that. Mm-hmm. I really, it, it just completely. I just stood there shocked. And it's an amazing animal. It, it really is with an amazing history. Mm-hmm. Well, that's I think that's I think that may be perhaps the best way to to start out. Uh, is maybe with a little bit of the history so and i don't know if there's too many too many species that are more iconic to the u.s than the turkey and it was nominated uh by ben franklin as our national symbol and we think of pilgrims and thanksgiving and and we continue that tradition today so it was interesting to find out that they were extirpated from the state in the mid 1800s so we wanted to 
to see if we could talk a little bit about the history and what brought them back. Yeah, well, um, it's good. Great, great point and great topic to start with. Um, so if you think about the birds, you know, at one time they flourished throughout North America. Um, we, we have, I mean, if you look at North America, there are six subspecies of wild turkeys. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, here where we live, we have the eastern wild turkey, which is the most dominant, uh, most predominant species of the wild turkey. But in the greater 50 states, you have... You have the the Merriam turkey, which predominantly, if you think about Montana, okay. you know Colorado, Wyoming, those areas out there, Nebraska, uh, your Merriam turkeys are the the dominant species. Uh, if you go down into Texas and Oklahoma, uh, and parts of California and up into Washington and Oregon, and even in Hawaii, you find the Rio Grande turkey, and they also uh, they also prevalent down uh, through New Mexico and into uh, Mexico. Okay. When you get uh, into Florida and you get kind of call it south of Jacksonville or Gainesville south, you have the Osceola turkey, the only place in the country where where those where that species uh, is prevalent. And then we have the Gould's turkey, which is a kind of a mountain turkey dweller. Uh, that bird is uh, predominantly in the in the mountain regions of Mexico. We did reintroduce those birds into a small portion of Arizona and New Mexico years back. So we've got actually now huntable populations by permit only in those two states. And then if you go down into the, uh, call it the Yucatan Peninsula of Mexico, we've got the oscillated turkey, which is a bird that, almost gives you the appearance of a small peacock Hmm. and he he's got a little bit different characteristics i I tell people i do these seminars throughout the year for the division of fish and game and i've done them at stockton college and other places people always ask me about you know the differences of the birds and you know i always tell them turkeys are turkeys (laughs) you know you know wherever you go you know the the habitat kind of dictates the biggest change there are characteristic differences in the birds in terms of markings and coloring and their plumage but but you know if you if you look at their you know how they go about their business for all intents and purposes turkeys are turkeys so if you look at the bird and you think about you mentioned uh you know the birds basically almost all but extinct yeah. in the lat part of 1800s well, you know, back in those days, there was a ton of things that happened. You know, you take example New Jersey, where we back clear cut the whole state, mm-hmm. and and then you think about market hunting, where back in the days uh, before the days of, uh, you know, uh, fish and game codes and laws and licensing, and you guys mentioned, I think Tom mentioned earlier, out the loophole and and uh, Teddy Roosevelt. Mm-hmm. You know, these guys were the, the visionaries that brought forward our ability to actually conserve our wildlife but back in the early days you know animals were were, were taken and sold and no one really thought much about their future the, the thinking of buffalo is a great example yeah. of that yeah. 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 so so you know when you, when you look at back in about the 1950s we were down to oh my goodness may, maybe call it a million birds left in the united states and there were only a handful of states such as like Alabama and South Carolina and parts up and down the river, Roanoke River system in North Carolina. and Which, which had it, the habitat still. Yeah, mm-hmm. certain mm-hmm. pockets that had wild turkeys left. But for all intents and purposes, uh, most states didn't have birds. And, and folks, you know, wanted to bring the birds back. And there were, a, oh, my goodness, a pile of different methods that folks tried trial and error to get the birds back everything from raising pen raised birds and releasing them by the thousands and they found out quickly that you know these birds did not possess the wild the the inherited wild traits that were going to help them survive and they died off and uh, it wasn't until there were some folks actually in virginia that came upon a, a process where they built these pens where uh, they could put in hens that were crossbred with domestic birds and wild birds, and the wild gobblers could actually get into the pen, breed the hens, and get back out. Oh, oh okay. And, and some of those eggs really began 
to become the birds that were used to restock populations through the United States. And as they began to find their way with that, you know, flash forward 1973, a fellow named Tom Rogers, uh, a guy that lived in Virginia, who really was just a, just a, you know, a, a guy who, you know, thought the world of wild turkeys and turkey hunting and, and conservation. He, he was the founder of the National Wild Turkey Federation. And he put this organization together simply to help restore populations of wild turkey because fish and game divisions, budgets throughout the United States, we hadn't fully matured yet with, with, uh, with funds such as Pittman Robertson and places where, you know, these, these divisions would get their funding. So folks had big ideas about how to get these birds back, but it, it really, you know, the timing of the national wild Turkey Federation couldn't have been better because Mm -hmm. These guys, you know, put this organization together, and really its sole purpose at that time was to, hey, raise raise money through donors and fundraising and and support the divisions in trapping and relocation of turkeys. And that's when things really began to take off. And when you look at, you know, you think about New Jersey, which, you know, if you prior to 1977, we didn't have a turkey in new wow. jersey and, and and yeah and 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 so we started our re our restocking in in new jersey in north jersey in 77 with i believe it was 22 birds wow. and those birds came from places such as new york and vermont and uh, there might have been some came from pennsylvania um but those birds those original birds um did so well in North Jersey from the beginning that in 1979 they were able to start to trap those birds, move them around to different parts of the state, and then I believe it was about 1981 we had our first season uh, for 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 hunting wild turkey. So that's how fast the birds began to you know bring themselves back. Now down here in the southern end of the state was a much different story, habitat being much different than North Jersey, you know, and they were trying to move the birds from up north down here, but we, we, we didn't have much success at all. And interesting enough, and in, 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 I think, in 1985, we made an agreement with the state of Arkansas and actually traded them rough grouse. Mm-hmm. And if you think about New Jersey today, we're, we, you know, we're, we're going to make a run here soon at trying to restore some grouse habitat in New Jersey to try to, but the birds have been delisted. They're no longer huntable Mm -hmm. uh, in the state of New Jersey. And we hope that unlike the Bob white quail, we may get our arms around this thing sooner than later. But anyway, traded some grouse to Arkansas for about 16, 18 hens and brought those birds to South Jersey, brought a couple gobblers from North Jersey. And that, stocking in south jersey became the footprint for all the birds you see today wow well it's yeah. amazing so how it's, small you know one of one of the more impressive things that that you mentioned the fact that it started in 1973 and that's not a period in time that i really think is being you know our country being great conservationists yeah. you know I, I, although you know it was in the early 70s I, I mean i can remember up through like 76 77 with the 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 fog truck coming through my development at night oh, spraying yes. ddt and, and and as kids riding behind it on our bikes trying to stay in the fog yeah, you know you sure. know you know and this precedes that you know and i think 1973 was the clean water act was passed so it was really just i think the beginning of a change at that point and mm-hmm. it was i mean I, to me that's visionary at that that time yeah. frame for that to happen absolutely a real grassroots movement and, uh, you know, look, I mean, today we're an organization, we've got, uh, you know, upside of 300,000 members and, you know, we, I mean, turkeys are still the, you know, you know, primary, you know, post on our logo, but we really have evolved into what, what I'm proud to say, a full scope conservation organization. And, uh, we get involved in a host of work throughout the country that benefits all species of wildlife and 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 our and our habitat so well that's actually that, one of our questions for you i mean since the uh prioritization which which is a true success story i mean as you said like there were no birds here it's it's deprioritized but wild turkeys become a, a 
fantastic indicator species of a healthy habitat for and and shared habitat with other endangered species so um why do you think that is it is it do you think it's the creation well, of habitat well what we found is, is that you know when you think about old growth mm-hmm. which we we have a lot of right throughout yeah. the country oh yeah what we found with the turkeys is that, you know the things they seek out about that you know or you know they find for you know they find cover they find roost and they find good brood areas so that that's one of the things that we kind of have ridden on the birds to show us the way to how to make best use of this the, the old growth if you will um that coupled with and you know and i you know i have a camp in north carolina eastern north carolina so i think about down there because i've watched over the last 20 plus years you know the kind of clear cutting and secessional planning of in most cases replanting of pine whether it's you know short leaf or loblolly and you know how to integrate you know bring a forest back and it's done obviously primarily down the road for logging but there's got to be some hopefully some sensitivity towards wildlife but we know that you know when we cut all our hardwoods you know we lose cover we lose we lose good roost and we lose mass crop which is uh, you know a huge part of a wildlife sustenance you know mm-hmm. so that the birds, you know, and I, and when you think about the indicator species, that that's what they gave us. And what what the the, the NWTF has done, and I, I know as we sit today, I believe we are the we're the number one uh, NGO in the country in terms of su- monetary support with the National Forest Service for control burning. Wow! Oh wow! I didn't realize and, that. Yeah, yeah, and it, and it's uh, you know again you know when when you look at our our forests you know I mean these are these are all part of the ways we keep a healthy understory, mm-hmm. right? I mean yeah. even though when you think about New Jersey, it's very difficult, <laughs> as it, you guys know. Yeah, oh yeah, it, it is. So you, one know, of, we, you could do a whole show on that, but yeah. I, th- that, I think we're planning on it. Yeah. Actually, we're, but, but we're, I, yeah, someone I've recommended a few the, deer the specialists. Yeah, yeah. When it when it's well thought out and well managed, there's nothing better to 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 keep a forest healthy, especially an old forest, than tend to burn it. Yeah, mm-hmm. and, and and let it come back. You know. And so um, I hope I don't know if that's answering your question, but it 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 it's that's what that's where the birds benefits came in when you when when we look at it as an indicator species, mm-hmm. it was it was kind of following their path and letting up letting them show us the way uh, in in terms of uh, you know how they depend and how they use old growth. Mm-hmm. So, so Lou, there was one thing I. For our listeners, just to clarify a little bit, I want to circle back to, and you use the words roost, brood, and cover uh, is things that turkeys need. I'm, I would assume most people understand what cover is. That's just having the vegetation so that they are, they're covered up. Yeah. Um, but, yeah, well, let me I'll elaborate on that yeah. for you. So when we think about cover, you know, in, in order for, you know, turkeys, the, the best case scenario for them, if you th- think about, let's use grasses, you know, hmm. Uh, when we think, especially here in South Jersey, because we have a lot of agriculture and clean farming, you know what clean farming mm-hmm, yeah. looks like, yeah. right? Mm-hmm. You know, it's it's cut and mowed and planted right up to a woods line. Mm-hmm. And if you don't have some sense of growth, I, I, you know, eight inch, six, eight inch, 10 inch grasses that can actually kind of roll over at the top. Mm-hmm. That's 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 an optimum situation for a wild turkey for mm-hmm. for uh not only nesting but brood turkeys don't and i you know i i don't really know that anybody knows why they're not the greatest engineers of <laughs> nest placement <laughs> right i mean yeah. you, you know it, it, it's uh it, it's it's very uncanny the places we find uh you know clutches of eggs and we think oh my goodness why you know why would this hen put this nest here you know and and then you look at it but there is a there is a method to their madness and when they have good grass growth if you will 
um, the, the the Pults, you know, when we think about broods, they, that gives them a system to navigate around in, mm-hmm. which keeps them away from predators in an early stage. Takes about, you know, takes a takes a pult about about two weeks before it can fly up on a mm-hmm. roost. Yeah, and you that's know, so, uh, I guess one of the things I want to point out that turkeys actually, while they spend most of their day on the ground, are overnighting way up in in trees. So they they don't fly much, but they do fly up in the, well down from the trees every morning and then up into the trees every night and that's cuz there's so many things coming after them between owls and hawks and coyotes and people is probably one of the, the smaller groups that's actually actually coming after them. Um, oh yeah. But there's so many things after them that they really uh, I Yeah, it's amazing. And a lot of people, you know, I I've done seminars over the years mm-hmm. where I've actually had folks argue with me and thought that I was Kibitzing with them over, you know, telling them about how you know a turkey pitches up to a roost yeah. at night, yeah. and I've had folks because I always bring a mounted bird, you know, mm-hmm. to the seminar so they can, you know, I can take them through the the bird and its you know anatomy and such, and they'll say that thing you you got to be kidding me that thing doesn't go up in a yeah. tree. Well, <laughs> yeah, because yeah, they're the big, they're does. they're they're big and they're clumsy. They weigh like twenty yeah. some pounds, and and yeah, for a mature you know, tom is. Him. Pretty Folks heavy. don't realize a turkey, yeah. you know, top end speed about fifty five miles an hour. Wow. Wow. I didn't in know flight, that. you know, and he can run almost twenty miles an hour. Yeah. That's so they're they're pretty agile. They're very <laughs> unagile when it comes to getting to roost. <laughs> yes, I think yeah. you, it was that Fran you just mentioned that. Yeah, if you're yeah. ever around them when they crash in for the night, it's uh, yeah, they're clumsy. It's a, they're... it's a pretty clumsy experience. <laughs> yeah. So what would you speaking turkey? Since we're talking turkey. What, in your opinion, what do you think makes turkey so important? Why is this bird so important for us to to preserve and and, and have here? You know, I think they're just uh, to me they are, and, and this is where I'm going to get a little spiritual with you because to me they're they're the epitome of this great republic's history. They just they just represent to me all about what what what. America was founded on and and our settlers and our beginnings and you know I mean you can you can factor in the pilgrims if you want even though there's when you really dig into <laughs> the first Thanksgiving it's a little different than what we see yeah and, yeah you know but 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 at the end of the day the wild turkey um, has always been a symbol in some respect of 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 uh of North America, mm-hmm. it's been there. It's it's been there. It was there w- with the indigenous Indians. It was there, you know. Well, I mean, there's documented the Spanish explorers documented in writings in the 1500s wild turkeys that were domesticated by the the Maya Indians. Wow. So when you think about the history of these great birds, it's it's just amazing. So to me, they're they're. Um, I, I, I guess I'd say flash forward to today when I look at, and I heard you guys earlier talking about loss of habitat mm-hmm. and that's something that keeps me awake at night. So when I think about habitat, I can't think of an, an animal much better to center uh, the importance of protecting habitat around much more than a wild turkey. Because if we do a good job of protecting habitat for animals such as wild turkeys we're going to be doing a great job of protecting habitat for hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of other Mm -hmm. species of wildlife and i think people forget you know it's it it's not a problem until they almost disappear until it's almost too late and it's it's, right it's kind of hard not to be a little romantic about the turkey in the same way like even the bald eagle because it's a symbol of the nation it's a symbol of our history and who we are and it, and it's a shame that it takes until it's almost gone before people to give it that that extra thought like oh what have we done <laughs> you, you know because a lot of times what's happening with loss of habitat is you're not thinking of what it does to the turkey or other animals mm-hmm. so you're just thinking oh we have more people we need more houses we need more roads better ways to get here and there and then then everything else is the afterthought you know, I, I hate to say, you know, my opinion. I mean, I think humans, by and large, are irresponsible consumers, mm-hmm. yeah. and 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 you know, don't stop much to think about, you know, 
what are we doing when we, you know, I mean, I, I ride around, and, you know, I, I, you guys, you know, I, you sound like you guys are pretty well versed in a lot of things. I mean, I, I always tell folks, and this is fact. So in the United States, on a year over year basis, we lose about the equivalent land mass of Yellowstone Park each mm-hmm. year to, to, to development. And, and when I tell people that in seminars, they say, well, nah, nah, that's ridiculous, you know. And I said, well, okay, here's a little thing for you. You know, in your little world you circle around in, I said, I'll ask you to start taking mental note of things that, of wood, woodland, wood lots, woodland habitat that was there and isn't there anymore or it's going away right before your very eyes. And at the end of that calendar year, just take a reflection of that and think about that's just in your little world. And I guarantee you, when you take that assessment, you'll you'll quickly realize that that's probably not such a far-fetched statement. No, mm-hmm. I, you know, when you look at woods, I think a lot of people look at forests and just see trees. Um, they don't think of habitat or food source or cover. No. Um, so when you take that away, it, it there's not enough to support the the numbers that we have today. So obviously, numbers are going to decrease. You, you decrease habitat, you decrease numbers. So um, and that's the hard thing, and it's because it's not like it's being. It, it's not that it's as easy to recreate as it is to yeah. diminish. No, it's not. But one of the things I was impressed when I looked through your website was the emphasis on habitat creation and all the work. Do do you know numbers briefly, like the amount of habitat you've created? Well, so we, we embarked on a lofty goal about six years ago. It's a 10-year plan called Save the Habitat, Save the Hunt. And the idea in that was really to, to, to protect or refresh at least a million and a half acres. And, you know, we do, we're doing it through a, a host of ways. You know, it's, uh, you know, the control burning is factored into that. There's there's clean water projects we're involved in. If if you look at our if you look at our model, we break our we break the country down into about five different areas, being colonial forests and mountain regions, and and each one of them has their own specific needs and wants, and we try to back into that to to support the improvements in those particular areas. And and the other part of it that's important is, you know, each state chapter has what we call a super fund. So when okay. we go and raise money throughout the year, you know, we send a portion of the money, large portion to headquarters. And that money gets put into big scope projects like controlled burns and, and different things that are being done in, you know, federal lands and other places. But then locally we keep about 20 25 almost 25 percent of that money in the state and that money is to be used at our discretion for local conservation projects oh wow okay so we have autonomy in our own state to go out and partner with folks to do land improvements and and it's important for us because you know one it's you know it's how we re- it's part of one of our big recruiting tools Okay. You know, that we can go to the to the public, you know, OK, you know, you said earlier, you're not a hunter, but I feel comfortable, Fran, Fran correct? Yes. yes. I, I could recruit you, Fran, to become a member of the NWTF because I feel comfortable that I could demonstrate for you that, you know, by becoming a member or a volunteer, it, 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 you know, even if you didn't hunt, you could still play a big part in in the success of how we earn money and use that money for the greater good and 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 that's what i loved about your website because that was one of the big emphasis and and i noticed there was uh one of the stories was a project in virginia with davy tree wetland studies which is actually one of our customers um and they had partnered with um uh energy company to use or convert right away areas excellent yeah for yes for turkey habitat or and it's even monarch habitat um that's right you know and then the the seed the expired seed programs um i i guess maybe that's not the best way to say it but uh seed that well, is, is donated seed, there's two seed programs okay and uh if you want i'll, I'll, I'll give you a i would love that quick okay so one is called we call conservation seed program and what that is is that every year the nwtf gets 
that acquires um, call it seed that's about a year old. Yeah. So it's got maybe about a ninety percent germination rate guaranteed to it. And for that, you know, we might get uh, Roundup Ready corn. We might get uh, sorghum. Uh, there's a host of things that might come available. Now that seed, we buy it in large bulk. Okay. And sometimes what will happen is one state will buy a tractor trailer load of it, and then other states like New Jersey will eat off of that load, you know, because we may not need as much of it as, let's say, Pennsylvania. Yeah. Who's a, who's a higher end user of these things than we are. Okay. But it gives all of us an opportunity because the price point on that conservation seed is generally incredibly favorable versus what you would buy that seed for uh, at a supplier, you know, fresh, if you will. Yeah. So it gives people a chance to do some, to do some habitat work uh, with a smaller pocketbook, if that makes sense. Totally. Um, the second one is what we call the seed subsidy program. Now in that program, what we do every year is we fly, there's a, the, the NWTF will send us out a menu and they, they've got, they've done a great job. They've gotten much more expansive with the, the menu offerings. And these are, these are seeds that usually are primarily geared towards food, food okay. plot okay. seed and clovers and clover mixes and, and uh, you know brassicas and chufas and you know I can go on and on but uh, grasses warm season grasses a lot of different things like that but that program what what we do our state chapter we designate what we think are the top say three or maybe four seed offerings we're going to put out now I'll use chufa for example if chufa sells for eighty dollars a bag for a fifty pound bag. What happens is the member, each member is entitled to buy one bag on seed subsidy for half price. Oh, wow. Which means you would get the bag for $40. The state chapter, we put money in a fund, an escrow fund, and the balance of that bag is paid for by the state chapter. So it's a great member benefit. And, and I'll give you an example. I, I belong to a sportsman club here in South Jersey. We got about 2,000 acres. I'm not a member there anymore, but we've got about 2,000 acres there. For 12 years, I managed their turkey program. Mm, okay. And I introduced Chufa there, but I've been gone now for three, four years. So 16 years ago, I introduced Chufa and started out with about seven to eight acres. It's up to 12 acres now. And what I, I still order the Chufa for them, and every year I just get 12 members, membership numbers, and I put the order in for them, ship it to their, to their, the person they want to ship to. They write me a check. I pay for it. They write me a check. And they get 12 acres worth of chufa for half price. Wow. So the, this is another, it's, a, it's just another great benefit. And when you look at bigger states who have much bigger super funds, uh, it can turn into quite a, you know, quite a benefit for mm -hmm. for for statewide for for a lot of folks and you know these things well I, you know it, the other one is and you know but i don't want to jump ahead because i know you guys had asked a little <laughs> bit about <laughs> conservation projects but i'll talk a little bit no about but that. actually right that's on. perfect because we were actually we wanted to talk to you about conservation projects and even partners like you mentioned exelon if, if uh if there were other partners that you partner with and together yeah. doing great work we'd love to hear about that well, we, we you know we we've got a, I'll give you some we have a, a federal land we we help manage up in North Jersey called Thunder Mountain. Okay, and that's a that's a federal tract of land. We've been involved in that now for my goodness, oh I don't know twelve fourteen years, and we we up there we we really subsidize all the mowing, all the pruning, all the you know any necessity of planting that needs to be done. It's got a viable turkey population, a viable deer population uh we as hunters it's 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 good for us because uh the federal government has opened up opportunities on federal lands to increase hunting opportunities okay so for us it, it, it's 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 you know it's a win-win you know we're 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 supporting them with uh not only volunteer work uh through chainsaws and other things guys are doing but but then actually paying for some of the 
the habitat work that's done throughout the year to, to, to keep that, that track of land, you know, in a, in a healthy state. Nice. So that that's an ongoing project. We, we've partnered down here in the south with the Land of Sewerage Authority in Cumberland County. Mm, yeah. Now, that now Land of Sewerage has a lot of land. You know, when I say a lot of land, I mean, I'm thousands of acres that they that they have in their in their call it their stable yeah. if you will we got involved with that through the division of fish and game and it started as uh, a footprint to bring back bob white quail okay so we got in there and we started to manage uh the property to to create suitable habitat for bob white quail in the event we would get to a point where we would acquire wild quail and put them back in uh, and try to, you know, revive this population. Now that project's ongoing. A little bit has changed in the last couple of years in it. The Division of Fish and Game has decided to push one of their tracks uh, up to number one as the primary track for first introduction of birds. Okay. But Landis is kind of sitting at a solid number two. So we're continuing to do that habitat work there. They're a phenomenal partner. But what's happened there since we went in and started to plant the right kind of grasses, the right kind of brood cover, uh, thinning the forests, doing the things that, you know, we were doing. And we, we're, we're working there in a partnership with uh, uh, NRCS and uh, Audubon Society. And there's, there's a bunch of us involved in this. So, you know, which we, we like that, guys, honestly. Oh, we, yeah. You just mentioned we, a, yeah, a lot we, of great organizations uh, yeah, that, we're, that do a we're, lot of great work we're at our best and we're most excited when it's a partnership it's not you know we don't we don't have the funds here in new jersey to usually go in and hopefully say ah we want to be the you know because all we want to be is we want to be a part of a success story every that, everyone wants to be part of a success that, that's what story. we want to be you know we're happy to be a you know if a sign goes up and there's eight organizations on there well, good 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 on it well, that's uh, Marcus, yeah. Marcus Gray from Audubon International, when, when we had him on, mentioned, you know, sometimes grant money is limited and, and partnership is really necessary just to accomplish some of the goals that you have to accomplish. Yeah. And everyone's in the same situation. So if you can partner and make something happen where otherwise mm-hmm. you couldn't, why why wouldn't you and, partner? And I even alluded to it, I think, a long time ago in my opening remarks. But a lot, a lot of these projects or a lot of the goals have the same track. What's good for turkeys is probably pretty good for quail too, and probably could be pretty good for for uh, monarchs and birds and uh, bees. And it's not just even though NWTF's main goal is to create turkey habitat, it's helping out a lot of other things along the way. Exactly, exactly. It is uh, our biologist. We have a we have a local. Our, our biologist is a fellow named Mitchell Blake, great mm-hmm. guy. And, he, he covers New Jersey, Delaware, Maryland, and a small chunk of Pennsylvania. And, you know, Mitchell works right with myself and our, our, and our state chapter uh, on projects such as Land of Sewerage Authority. And, you know, as recently as not even a year ago, he got us a, a, a sizable grant from Bayer for pollinator seed. Mm-hmm. So we went in and I think like we're up to 15 acres now we yeah. oh, wow. we've awesome. done of you know some great work for pollination and pollinators and mm-hmm. so when we look at this you know you know number one is when you've got a private owner uh partner who's willing to put their best foot forward it just gives us you know gives us puts us halfway to success mm-hmm. because because they're excited we get excited then we can all go out the different organizations and secure grants and secure support and and do all the right things and and you kind of just mentioned i think fran you know it's one action equal opposite reaction to <laughs> yeah. to do good to do good work we're also excited about when we think about the division of fish and game it's um we feel like we're we're just in a great place right now with the division it's been a kind of a work in progress over the years to to build a relationship of of uh you know trust if you will where they they enjoy working with us we've always been there for them Uh, our volunteers do phenomenal work to help them with turkey relocations and supporting them with the boxes for relocation and and nets and you know resources but one of the big things we wanted to do is and if you look at the state of new jersey 
even though it's the most densely populated state, we've got a real generous amount of wildlife management area we, in, in the state we, of New Jersey. We do. We do. We do. And we're and we're and we're grateful for that. But one of the one of the things we all identified was is that, you know, we've got a lot of land, but we're not we're not really doing as good a job as we could do with food sources. Mm-hmm. You know, so what we've been able to do over the last few years is, and we've been increasing it each year, is we're we're buying seed for the division, and they're doing a great job going in and planting the seed and creating some phenomenal food plots for wildlife. Mm-hmm. And um, that, to me, is I almost have that now as one of the greatest wins we've got in the state because because yeah. mm-hmm. we got we've got momentum going with it right now. We're all feeling really good about it and. Uh, you know, there's nothing better to go down there at an off time of the season and look at deer and turkey. And, you know, I, for example, we ju- I just dropped them off a, a thousand pounds of buckwheat seed. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, of course, buckwheat, has got, got value of pollinators in it as well, mm-hmm. you know. So, so you kind of get, you get a little bit of everything as you, as you go and, and we learn as we go along, you know, what, what other things can we put in that's, not so dependent because they can't use treated seed Mm -hmm. so we have to we we buy untreated seed and we don't go haywire with fertilizers and we count on mother nature for a lot of help and but we but but honestly we've been we've been doing we've been doing pretty good that's so it's you know the whole thing and and you mentioned it's it's a give and take it's it's a give and take with everything with with just even creating balance so how would you explain to say a non-hunter like the how hunting turkey actually benefits the turkey, the the turkey population. Well, a couple of things. One, if you think about turkey populations, hunt, hunt, having the hunt the hunters, in my opinion, involved in the conservation wheel, gives you a for for the most part a responsible group of folks who can you don't have to do a lot of work to convince them no, they take ownership. as to why mm-hmm. to put, yeah, taking ownership. Now they begin to take ownership just by buying their license, mm-hmm. right? They buy their permit, they buy their license, uh, they buy, you know, if it's waterfowl, they buy stamps, the money goes for, you know, Pittman Robertson channels back to the divisions. So that's a win-win in itself, but there's a bigger dynamic involved in that, which is, you know, when we're, when we're recruiting members, you know, there's no better place to start. Say, okay, well, you know, you love the turkey hunt, and now how about we recruit you to join, you know, the National Wild Turkey Federation, and you volunteer a few hours of your time, and for simple as $35 a year, we can show you where your money goes, and oh, by the way, you're, you know, you're excited about the food plots on the fish and wildlife areas you hunt, and, you know, you, you like the idea that, we, we actually have a volunteer force that's able to move turkeys. Turkeys mm-hmm. get themselves in trouble in New Jersey. <laughs> you, you, you know, which is, you know, I, I, you know, I, I go crazy when people call them nuisance birds. But Oh, me too. Uh, there was a but big, you know, my, my fiancé lives down in the uh, Magnolia Gloucester Township area, and there was just, the, I guess, the animal control just put down a wild turkey that was hanging out on a street corner. It was just uh, like one kinda, singular, yeah, you know, and it that, was. That upset me. Yeah that that upset a lot of, and i think it was nice to see how many people that upset like how many people were outraged that 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 turkey was was put down just because it was being a nuisance it, it might not make sense to some of your listeners but and, and i think i know tom i i believe tom's gonna hearken this one but we love them we kill them and we eat them mm-hmm. yeah yeah. And and I'm proud of all of the above. Yeah. Yeah. And and you touched and, and, on a, and very grateful for that too. You touched on Pittman Robertson uh, or the Pittman Robertson Act a couple times now, and um, that's another thing I just want to clarify for everyone is that's a, an act that popped up in 1937 by I think it was either two senators or two congressmen I can't remember one of them named Pittman one of them named Roberts, Robertson. Yep. I don't remember what states they were from. That's <laughs> that's. Asking a lot of me if I have to remember that, but they basically put this act together that that um, basically took any like firearm or, or license sales or ammunition sales and directed that money to go back into habitat conservation and and do stuff for wildlife. So you weren't just uh, taking but also giving back. And um, 
a lot of people don't don't think about that that some of these parks and, and wildlife management areas that they go to and visit maybe to take a hike or, or um or do something where you don't really have any cost going in uh well there's oftentimes there's bathrooms at the parking area that you have a paved or, or and fenced parking lot you have some amenities there and you have a park ranger and people don't really recognize necessarily where that money might come from and that a lot of it is directed through that Pittman Robertson Act back to those areas so that they can have a staff and they can have a, someone to clean the bathrooms and just have a have a bathroom and have have those areas and as the public we get to enjoy a lot of that for for basically free um, but someone is paying for it and in this yeah. case it's it's the hunting uh, public yeah and I think one of the special aspects to the NWTF as well is and I, I just learned this while I was researching for our conversation today was that you actually present an award on a yearly basis to say like a uh fishing fishing game officer who maybe uh is able to catch the most uh hunting violations uh for turkey hunting or or something to that effect um we do which which is teaching people to hunt responsibly as well absolutely yeah i I, you know i mean uh, to your point fran i mean you know, you you guys referenced in your uh, in your uh, opener uh, about those those two uh, young men in Pennsylvania. Mm-hmm. I uh, you know I I almost interjected then and let my emotion get away with me, but uh, yeah, I don't call them hunters. You know, at the end of yeah, the day, neither do I. yeah, you know, people can get their hands on. Uh, you know, they're uh, we've got uh, unfortunately we've got uh, we've got bad bad actors that wander through society and uh you know don't drive cars responsibly don't 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 act don't play their part in leaders in their family responsibly not great actors at the workplace and unfortunately these people go off and get involved in 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 pastimes right such as boating and fishing mm-hmm. and hunting and so you know it hunting gets under the microscope because sure you know they're picking up a weapon and there's mm-hmm. there's 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 death or injury involved in it, and you know when these these people, folks like this, get involved in this, uh, I look at it. I, I have found that in most cases, when it comes to poaching uh, and or animal cruelty, uh, outside of the mental illness part of it, um, these are people. At one, obviously, should never touch a firearm or a weapon, as far as I'm concerned. Number two, usually, if you look at them. In most cases, they don't. They're not even up to date with the proper credentials to hunt. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And 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 so again, I I, I feel like you know it, it, it's a shame that we have that. But the best we can do is we've got you know we've got a fish and game service. That's to your point, friends. One of the reasons why we created the national program. We award a a fish and game officer on a state level. With, the, with an award, we present that award to them. And then that those winners vie for a national award. And the oh, national yeah. winners, they all the winners at a state level can go to our national convention in February, and then they can be a part of when we announce the national winner. And then that person gets to come up, and it's a pretty cool recognition. Mm-hmm. I didn't them. realize there was a national award. That's awesome. Y- yeah, yeah, it's a pretty big deal, actually. And uh, you know, and we're proud of that, of course. And um, you know, again, it just it's it's another you know further uh, you know strengthening that bond, if you will. With you know, people call me all the time. You know, and they're screaming at me about turkey population. <laughs> but, you know, you guys want to talk about that? We can get into the potential decline of the population. But people call me and say, oh, I don't have turkeys anymore. And, you know, you guys need to be doing more. You're not involved in this. And I go, well, okay, here's the deal. First of all, you don't understand. I can't get up in the morning and run around with a crab net catching turkeys on my own. <laughs> and, you know, we, we do these things in partnership with our division to fish and game. Henceforth, the founding of the National Wild Turkey Federation. Yeah. You know, so we we have to continue sometimes to remind people that, you know, there's a method to work how we go about it. and all the more reason why we need you as a member, you know, yeah, well, to help strengthen our, our ranks. For all the wonderful things we talked about that you've done to increase habitat, to increase uh, turkey populations, there, there's actually in part of the country, uh, there is decline. And you mentioned there is decline. So what? why do you think this is happening and what's our current situation here in New Jersey? Okay. Well, that's a good question. 
it, it is one right now that is, uh, I, I would tell you, top of mind probably with most every wildlife biologist uh, across this across the country and and folks like myself and turkey hunting enthusiasts and and conservation enthusiasts. What I would tell you is is that there's a there are a host of reasons. Now, here's what I'd say to you. If if you if the three of us were in a room right now, would let's you know we all went and picked our two or three favorite turkey biologists. Yes, we'd sit down and Tom would have his ideas and Fran, you'd have yours, and I have mine, and then you'd get a host of ideas, almost like college professors, okay. on subject matter about why this is happening. So the bad news, there's not a silver bullet <laughs> yeah. to fix it. That's the bad news. Yeah. The good news is. Eyes are open wide, and good work is being done to fix it, to get at, to get after it, if you will. So what I what I would tell you is this: habitat loss, probably number one. That that's our mm-hmm. our running theme with just about every podcast. <laughs> yeah. That's that's the yeah. number one concern. <laughs> it, look, you guys get it right. I mean, I heard your in, you know in your, your introduction, you get it. Habitat loss at the end of the day, um, there's no, you know, as I like to say, God's not making more land. Yeah. Um, so that is what it is. And, 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 and we're battling that as we speak, but, but inside of that, you know, we've got, we've got predation, right? Yeah. And predation comes in a host of ways. It comes from, we've got everything from, you know, when you think about the wild turkey, we've got all animals evolve. You guys know that. Yeah. You know the defense yeah. mechanisms or hunting mechanisms. I've watched coyotes. When I first started turkey hunting, coyotes hunting turkeys reminded me of the coyote in the cartoon <laughs> with the roadrunner. <laughs> you know, he was a yeah. pretty. He was a pretty ha- It was a feeble attempt at catching a turkey. Okay. Well, guess what? They're much better at it than they used to mm. be. Their turkeys are still not number one on their diet. So, you know, coyotes, the coyotes, they deserve a bad rap, but they also get a bad rap. Yeah. Mm-hmm. You know, that's in my opinion. But look, you've got, you think about your nest, right? You've got everything from fire, right? Mm-hmm. Fire that's not controlled. You've got snakes, you got possums, you got raccoons, you got skunks, you got weasels, you got. Uh, they're eating the eggs. Yeah. There's nothing yeah. worse yeah. than having a than having a, a raccoon go in and clean out twelve eggs. Well, wow. no, they, they, there goes the neighborhood, right? Yeah. So, so we're dealing with that, and then and now and then we have we have weather, mm-hmm. right? Weather plays a big factor. We're, we're we're dealing with it right now because we've already got hens, you know, that are sitting their nests, and and you know when these little guys are hatched out. You know, nothing is more detrimental to to poults than hypothermia. Mm-hmm. And and so early in their their lives, you know, we get excessively cool weather and rain and we can really knock the dickens out of an upcoming year of turkey mm-hmm. population. Mm-hmm. Now we've got humans, right? Yeah. And and what well, we hunt them, right? And and that's gotta be factored in there. Mm-hmm. So we're looking at a host of things right now. We're 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 obviously looking at habitat, so where we're losing habitat improving what we have is even more paramount now than than ever before but we're also looking at our seasons you know mm-hmm. we're, we're looking at you know is does it make sense to hunt turkeys all day mm-hmm. yeah. right uh does it make sense to have in many states liberal bag limits mm-hmm. south carolina just embarked this year on significantly cutting their bag limits they postured for a long time because it's an emotional situation, yeah. Yeah. but now through really necessity, have at least there are things we can control. Yeah, I mean, in order, I, I, in, in order to hunt, to have a population, you have to have a certain population mm. to sustain hunting in order to Absolutely. hunt. Absolutely. So you yeah. have to, you know, and, and you talk about predation, like even raccoons, well, when you suffer loss of habitat and maybe they're, they have less things to go after, so they have to go after turkey eggs now. Mm. Maybe that, you know, there's, there's so many factors that are leading to all these other things that are intertwined. That yeah. and, and Lou, you can correct me if I'm wrong on the statistic, but it was just, uh, something I heard recently where it was uh, a, a turkey hen lays 
a certain amount of eggs, only 20% of those eggs are actually going to hatch. Then only 20% of the, the hatchlings are actually going to make it past their first year. And I think it was another 20% would make it past their second year because there's so many things coming after these birds. Um, at yeah, least that's, that's a, further um, down in the, the southeast. That's a pretty good number, Tom. Mm-hmm. So, so if, you, yeah, but if you look at a hen, generally she's going to lay about 10 to 12 eggs in a clutch. Mm-hmm. So let's say all 12 eggs hatch. Okay. When we do our studies, poll counts, we count – any survival of four and above is phenomenal. Mm-hmm. Being four being considered really good. Mm-hmm. If, if you think about wild turkey populations as a whole, almost about 50% of turkeys die every year. Wow. And that comes, mortality comes from a lot of places. So it's, I, I, I gave you guys a bunch of them. Yeah. And the mortality does not discriminate. It, 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 it's going to kill old birds, going to kill young birds. It's going to kill all kinds. So, so if you if you look at your adult population, and you and you think about this mortality rate, if you're able to have about four poults live on an average, you you actually are pretty close to a stable population. Mm-hmm. When it falls below that, now you're now you're you're heading into some 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 murky water. So. You know, where we're at in many places is that there have been successive years of bad hatches due to uh, high predation, uh, bad weather for pulp, for, for uh, pulp survival. Uh, Nor- New Jersey actually is a, is a great uh, uh, example. It's like a, a tale of two cities. It's uh, North Jersey, which was the the beginning of the turkey um, reintroduction and, and for many years enjoyed really healthy populations are now struggling with our populations in North Jersey. Now, a lot of that has been, it's riding on the backs of development and it's riding on the backs of a, a, a bunch of years where they had really bad hatches yeah. and they've had a hard time kind of getting their feet under them. South Jersey, on the other hand, in most of our zones down here, we, we've been able to hold on and be pretty stable with our turkey population. I wouldn't tell you that it's anywhere near what it was six or eight years ago, but it's still pretty stable. And some of the biologists will tell you that, well, it's just worked itself to what they deem to be the right manageable population. Mm-hmm. I don't always buy into that because I don't know if less is better. I always think, hey, you know what? I want to see the birds. Um, I feel better when I see them, and they look healthy, and it makes me feel better. And so, we, you know, what we're looking at, you know, if you look at New Jersey, New Jersey has got a very liberal bag limit. Mm-hmm. You know, if you want to go buy permits and get online and shop the lottery, <clears throat> excuse me, you, you can get your hands on a bunch of turkey permits, and mm-hmm. if you're one of those folks that's really successful, but you can go out there and you can knock down a bunch of birds. Yeah. I come from the world, because I've been hunting in North Carolina for 25 years, and they've been hardcore two birds, anywhere you want, two birds, that's it. You kill two, you're done, no fall mm-hmm. season. I'm fine with that. Mm-hmm. You know, because to me, it's, hey, you know what? On our farm in North Carolina, we've got a very stable turkey population. And I attribute it to, mm-hmm. hey, you know what? The predators get their share, weather gets their share, we get our share, and Mother Nature is making it work. Yeah. yeah. And I'll, I'll say I actually get a little jealous of some of my friends that live in other parts of the country that, that like tur- hunting turkeys as well because they'll say, oh, yeah, I'm allowed to shoot two birds over a month and a half or three birds or whatever the number is where we get one per permit but you only get a week to per permit and i'd I'd much rather be able to hunt for a month and be able to only have one or two birds versus having a week and i could load up on permits for that week Uh, yeah you know you know tom it's it's i tell you i go around and around with new jersey on this one because uh I, I've been involved with it, you know, and I, I think the world of our biologist, Tony McBride, I like mm-hmm. Tony a lot. He's a good guy, and I count on him as a resource. There's another gentleman, Bob Erickson, who was our biologist for many years, and he's a 
just a world-class guy mm-hmm. and, and a world-class reference when it comes to the wild turkey. But I, I sit back sometimes and I think, on one hand, I don't like our permit system. But on the other hand, I think about what would, given South Jersey now having the the better of the, call it the better of that two halves of the population. Mm-hmm. Yeah. What would our what would our turkey season look like if we let all ten thousand turkey yeah. hunters, <laughs> yeah, all out at once, you know, have on it on a week, yeah, yeah. right? And I, then then we might find ourselves in a in a in a world of, so that's where I would go mm-hmm. to say, okay, well, look, you know, I still gravitate back to the, the two bird, and and this is a emotional argument that I have mm-hmm. yeah. with some of my friends who, you know, they say. Do me a favor, Lou. Keep that to yourself. <laughs> you know, and I say, come on now. You know, let, let's think about this. You know, let's let's talk about. You know, you're out with your best friends, your wife, your or your or your your sons or daughters, or you know, and you're hunting, and you know, you, you know, you got two permits, Tom. You've got two, Fran, and I've got two. And you know, the hunting is not just you taking an animal. Mm-hmm. There's there's th- this whole dynamic in hunting of. Uh, the bond and the, you know, the being one with nature and, you know, so isn't it, you know, as long as you've got an excuse to be out there, I mean, all, to me, all is good. Yeah. And, and I guess that's almost kind of what I was getting at is it gives me the excuse to be out there with, and I I'm, don't know the science behind our current system, but if I only have the excuse to be out there a week, well, I'm going to go all five days. But if I have the excuse to be out there a month, I might not go all 30, but I'll go 10 or 15. Mm-hmm. And yeah. just, it's not about necessarily the kill. I mentioned before, my probably my least favorite part is the shot and the actual take. It's it's enjoying nature and then enjoying uh, the harvest yeah. is, is part of it. It's uh, The take is probably the part I like the least. You and I are on the same page with that one, brother. I, I, I couldn't agree with you more. And But, you know, uh, these things will evolve. I mean, at the end of the day... Um, if we get ourselves in a pinch down here in the south with our population <clears throat> i'm sure they'll have to look at this thing but mm-hmm. a lot of states are looking at it and yeah. you know all day hunting we can we can hunt all day in d week mm-hmm. which are the last two weeks many states you can hunt north carolina i can hunt all day mm-hmm. i personally i love quitting at noon mm-hmm. i do mm-hmm. i th- that was originally set up so hens could go to nest and mm-hmm. and have that better part of the afternoon to be peaceful and not get disturbed and and not have them get run off the eggs and all the things that you know are really important for the success of the bird so i tell people you know i've been you know i've I've hunted turkeys i think i don't know god 23 or 24 states including mexico and you know so i i've been blessed to go all over the place and hunt these birds and you know at the end of the day I would tell you probably 10% of the birds I've harvested in my life were harvested in afternoon hunts. Mm-hmm. So it doesn't upset me if it goes away. Yeah. So uh, moving along here a little bit, but we talked about uh, when you're you're eating turkeys, and that's part of the, the whole uh, system here. What's your favorite wild turkey recipe? Oh, boy. <laughs> so, I've, been, I've been looking forward to this answer. <laughs> yeah. Okay. I may not well, hunt so, turkey, but so I one, love so one of them turkey. I enjoyed so one of them I enjoyed last night. So it's fresh in mind. So you know, for many years I processed my own meat. Mm-hmm. Okay. My own deer, everything I you know, everything. Fish, deer, whatever, you know, rabbits and squirrels and turkeys and well, guess what? Gotten a little lazy, maybe a little smarter. I don't know which one it is, <laughs> but I am very blessed. There's a fella down in Woodbine, New Jersey, Bell Plain, excuse me, Bell Plain, New Jersey, that processes meat. Okay. And he does a phenomenal job with my turkeys. And he makes me everything from meatballs to breakfast sausage to Italian sausage. Mm-hmm. And now I got him started on uh, what I call like an Italian cutlet mm-hmm. where they're pounded out. And, I'll, you know, one of my favorites is to take that cutlet and dredge it in flour, dredge it in egg, and dredge it in some Italian breadcrumbs or some house sautry, and either bake it off or fry it off. Mm-hmm. And I want to tell you, it don't get any better. I'm getting hungry <laughs> just thinking about it. That, we could probably that, well, that's only one, and, and you know, I don't know if y'all have a smoker like a Traeger. Mm-hmm. Yeah. 
Uh, boy, I'll tell you what, a Traeger can do it and can do amazing things with wild turkey meat. And, uh, you know, you, you, you turn around and cut that breast meat in thin strap strips or, or half your breasts and brine that breast and smoke it, uh, slow, low and slow. And I will tell you, it, it just, it, it just doesn't get any better. We could probably do a whole episode on. Mm-hmm. Well, on yeah. And you know, <laughs> turkey nuggets, uh, you know, dredged in buttermilk ranch dressing and dropped in your deep fryer uh, that's a way you can go but they make great breakfast sausage mm-hmm. my guy makes me maple brown sugar wild turkey breakfast sausage it, yeah. it, you know it, yeah, so yeah. anyway I'm, hopefully I'm, I'm giving you <laughs> oh, yeah. no, I'm just sitting here licking my lips like you can't see it but I have a look on my yeah, face like and, man and look, I'm hungry grind it and put it in chili mm-hmm. Uh, makes a phenomenal chili. You can make phenomenal burgers. Mix 20, 15, 20% pork yeah. with it. Yeah. Just so it's, it's easy to get because, you know, there's no fat in it. So you're going to keep yeah. it together yeah. a little bit. Yeah. But um, uh, very yeah, good eating. Yeah, nothing, sounds, yeah, nothing, yeah. nothing better than going in the freezer and taking out your your your, your harvest. And, and that uh, you said it earlier, Tom, you know, that's that's reliving it all mm-hmm. again in, in the, at the highest order. Yeah, and and for me, it's I get all those emotions back. You have the 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 proudness that you you worked really hard for something, and then you were successful. I think anything you do, if you're successful, you feel a sense of pride in that, and um, you feel a bit of sadness because you took a life. It's it's yeah, it's I, just I, the human in you that you feel some sadness in that. And when you cook it, I feel that same those two emotions come back to me every time. Um, hunting has become very spiritual for me yeah. and uh and that's been and and my three sons hunt and i i really you know try very hard to instill it in them i'm very proud of the way they handle themselves in the outdoors mm-hmm. they become great mentors and and uh you know when we think about the, the nwtf while we're a you know we're a big conservation organization we're also a hunting organization mm-hmm. you know mm-hmm. and so we we we, we, we kind of go down both roads and we try to do both as responsible and, and fulfilling as we can. Mm-hmm. So you've made it clear that this is not something you're going to have to suffer through eating. <laughs> so that's a, a uh, really important yeah, well, point. Here, is, here's what I, yeah. here's where I'll summarize it for you. <laughs> I'll be happy to share deer meat with you guys, <laughs> even though I'll do it reluctantly, but I would, I would gladly do it. I probably would not mention sharing. Like turkey <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, uh, uh, just, Getting the last couple questions in here, if you had one main point for someone to take away from this, what would it be? To take away from our our, our conversation, yeah. I, I think to me, like you were just summarizing it up, almost saying that yeah. not only you're a hunting organization but also a conservation organization. Mm-hmm. I don't know that that many people look into how much good work you're doing. Thank you, friend. And here's what I'd say: take away this that. You can be a part of an NGO, right? Mm-hmm. You can be a part of NWTF. You can be a part of Ducks Unlimited. You know, there's a bunch of good organizations out there you can be a part of. Uh, you may, you may come into it with a, you know, a, you know, hopefully some sense of a view of hunting, mm-hmm. whether it's negative, it's in the middle, it's you're very pro hunting. But one thing that I would tell you is that. What it'll do is, I think, is help put you in a more informed place and help you be a greater steward of the outdoors. Mm-hmm. I, I, leave, I leave the listeners with a little homework assignment. I do it in all the seminars I give. Right. I ask them all, regardless of whether you hunt or you don't hunt, go familiar, familiarize yourself with the North American conservation model. Mm-hmm. It is the absolute best in the world. It's something that everybody in the United States has got a stake in. Mm-hmm. And, and you know, it, it, if you, you read it and you embrace it, at least you'll come away understanding that whether you like it or not, you are one of the stewards of our wildlife. Yeah, and they and need I, us. I, I don't think enough people realize yeah, that or, or take I'm stake in that. glad you brought it up, too. And that's another thing we could have a whole episode on. But that what we have in the United States and, and Canada and, I guess, Mexico as well, you don't get that in in other countries, uh, specifically Europe, where 
it's still whoever owns the property owns owns the animals and um it's a, if, if there's a deer and it's on your property that doesn't belong to you when it comes to the united states it belongs to the american people and uh and you have to go through a process to be able to take that deer because it doesn't just belong to one person it belongs to everybody so i'm really so, glad you brought that part up well oh. you know and and i think that kind of to me summarizes it almost even goes back to when fran asked me why is why is the wild turkey important to hunting mm-hmm. you know and it, mm-hmm. it falls right into that you know the wild turkey plays a big part in that you know it's 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 part of the model it's it's in there you know and it's uh it gives people a chance that might be enthusiastic about particular species or particular areas of the country to to get their arms around what's really going on in that area mm-hmm. cuz look here in new jersey we've got our own battles right we've got our own projects we've got our own visions you know which are significantly different than those of the folks in idaho yeah and uh so we we you know we all we all we all play the same game but we play it with different cards if you will well what i'm sure of is that we have after today and after this podcast that we have listeners that hopefully are going to get involved with with what you're doing and help even if they're not hunters mm-hmm. with with doing the right thing and creating habitat for not just turkey but for other living creatures on this earth yeah. to for, you know, for everyone's it's not for our enjoyment it's just because we coexist with them and yeah. that's absolutely you know it's but we're 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 sure you know people can go to the website get involved that way um and and hopefully they do but we 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 kind of have to wrap it up a little bit because we're getting we're getting towards the end and we always end this with the same question and it's a very important question so what is your favorite native plant and and we've actually expanded that the native birds yeah, as well true. but we i think we know your answer what your, na- <laughs> what your favorite so native bird are, is be. it a plant or is it a is it, would that include a tree or what? Oh, include... yeah. Yeah, it could be a, a wallflower, a tree, a shrub. It can be. It can so, be I, so I'm going to I'm going to throw a couple at you, but okay. when I think about tree, uh, you know, I, I here at our property here we've got we've got laurels, which I I always loved our laurels, especially when they bloom, and then last but not least the the, the red cedar. Nice, mm. very nice. That's that's an important important tree in so many different ways we joke about it here because we (laughs) in one of the episodes we actually brought some into the office not realizing how bad it would make the office smell for the podcast out in the the open they tend to be okay in confined spaces they they... yeah it's a little little tough but (laughs) great it's a great plant so um do you have a final thought for today we we try to leave everyone with with one final thought um if you wanted to summarize or just just something you want to touch on that we haven't talked about uh and it could be anything you want so so my final thought would be this i i try to i'm 64 now i try to envision myself hunting uh all the way until i can no longer participate in it now when i say that that the the hunting will encompass a lot of things. It'll be the spiritual involvement in the outdoors. But what, what I want to, to say is, is that regardless of whether if you took my hunting away from me tomorrow, I would be just as passionate and have just as much energy to protect, protect our great outdoors and our mm-hmm. wildlife. Mm-hmm. And I, I wake up every morning feeling like I just don't do enough. And honestly, hunting has nothing to do with that. Yeah. So I hope that makes sense to you. But it, 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 oh, yeah. it makes it's, perfect it, sense. It, for me, it's a big deal. Some of my friends, you know, they, I think they want to throw cold water in my face sometimes. <laughs> I probably hear a little, you know but what? I know they feel the same way, too. And I just, we've all got our, you know, but I I have never been more, uh, I don't know. I just feel like our, our, our outdoor, our, our wildlife and our and our habitat has never needed us more than it than it does right now i i kind of feel like it's a, it it depends on one's connected connectiveness with nature and it's it's almost like a, a moment of enlightenment and not everyone's yes. there yet mm-hmm. you know and it's yeah it, sometimes it, it takes seeing a tremendous amount of loss of habitat or wildlife you probably to, just to spark frame that. that up that's the what you just said was probably where i was trying to get to 
everybody's not there yet mm-hmm. and I wish they would be. Yeah, I hope I hope I and and part of our goal of this podcast is is helping everyone everyone get there. Every you know, we we hope that you know, we just don't want to preach to the choir. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. We, we want to bring some people along with us that weren't there. Well, my experience with this has been phenomenal. Um, I appreciate y'all giving me an opportunity to share some time with you. Oh, we, we appreciate you yeah. coming on. We appreciate you coming on. All right, Tom, do I get a final thought? Do you want you, to go first? Why don't you, you want... throw it to me? I always throw it to you. All right, so. Tom, your final okay, thought. Okay, now ahead. I'm going to get you upset because I actually have two. All right. <laughs> <laughs> All right, go ahead. The first one's quick. All right. So – this was actually pre-planned earlier in uh, when I was talking about my views on hunting. I you may have noticed I used the word Nimrod, um, and that was on purpose because it's seen today as really a, a negative word. It means that someone's kind of a numbskull or, or stupid, and um, but historically it's actually a biblical, a biblical figure, and uh, that person named Nimrod was actually the king of Mesopotamia, and he was known for his hunting prowess. So now. Friend, you can rest assured that when people hang up the phone with you and say, "Oh, what a Nimrod," they're actually giving you a compliment. <laughs> All right, <laughs> you didn't know. Woo! Yeah, I definitely <laughs> but, learned something today. <laughs> but um, my second one is is, and I know, Fran, you're probably going to hit on this too. But it's we keep coming back to the loss of habitat, and where I'm going to go with this is we've really as we've developed the landscape and we have all these larger housing developments, we're taking away more and more forested land or grasslands and really important habitat and our landscapes are we're losing that ecological services that they provide and we're relying on them in our open spaces and now as we're turning a lot of those open spaces into soccer fields or baseball fields or pavement or or different buildings well we're losing those ecological services outright so it's important to bring those back it's important not just conserve habitat but but to replace habitat and in some cases in particularly the wild turkey well, they, they need a lot of native plants like uh, your viburnums, and they eat a lot of acorns, so they need the oak trees, eat a lot of insects. So anything that brings in insects, they really need that. But we need to supplement that because they just don't have enough. And that's uh, when, when we're talking about food plots. That's one of the reasons that they're so important because we just don't have enough habitat to support them with just native vegetation like there was in 1700s and when there was uh, just some early colonists and Native Americans. So, Fran, how about you? All right, so... Going back, just reflecting on everything that we talked about today, there are two sides to every story, and and most of the arguments that I see when people are arguing, it it's there. I see passion, but I see a lack of factual information, uh, or the information is being twisted to fit an agenda. So I think that we have been fortunate enough to bring our listeners multiple views on ecology. And, and these views need to find the space to coexist mm-hmm. with, with one another. We're experiencing a loss of habitat that is completely throwing off the balance of life as we know it uh, and will continue in that manner. And, and we need to work together to fix it. And I'm proud of the guests that we've had on. Yep. Um, and I'm proud of the conversations that we've had and our associates uh, that deal with all of these types of um, loss of habitat. So. Um, and all these other issues that we've been discussing. So I feel really optimistic about our future, yeah. Um, oh, yeah. knowing that there's enough like-minded people out there and that keeps growing. And and Lou, thank you so much for coming on today. We really appreciate uh, what you brought to our podcast today. Thank yeah. you. I, I, I very much appreciate it. And I just want to commend you guys. It's uh, great work you're doing. This is a, a, a phenomenal investment in uh, in something that's near and dear to a lot of our our hearts thank you well, thank you we, we we we're taking it very yeah. seriously oh yeah <laughs> <laughs> so with that we want to thank everyone at home listening to this or driving or, or working whatever you're doing we want to thank you for joining us today we hope you enjoyed listening and learning about the nwtf or national wild turkey federation um we can't stress enough we really thank you guys for listening uh to our podcast uh, we're putting a lot of work into this and and hoping you enjoy it um, and if I could uh, just add, you know, please go to nwtf.com, shop our website. I'm I'm going to um, add a third final thought. <laughs> I just remembered this. <laughs> you mentioned there was uh, 300,000 um, members to NWTF nationally, which is a huge, huge organization. But you actually got that number wrong because it's 300,001 because I actually joined yesterday. It's something I've been God meaning to do you. for a long time. But uh, you made my it's, uh, it's $35. It's if you're if you're under 30 or 35 
skip a night out of the bar. I like guess you, you're skipping them all right now. Yeah. You're not going yeah. out to the bar. So, but that's a, a bar tab or, or dinner tab. So, yeah. eat dinner at home one night, and and you can. Okay save that money and, and spend it on an NWTF membership. Lou, how can how can people join? People can join simply by going to the NWTF website. Okay. And right literally at the top of the page, it'll say join now. You can click on that. And it's particularly turnkey. I I, I think, and I don't want to, but I think they're still offering a uh, a pretty good offer for new members. Yeah, it, and I'll, I'll, the, since I did it yesterday, I know that you could either get a, a NWTF knife set or um or a twenty five dollar gift certificate the Bass Pro Shops so oh, basically exactly. it's a ten dollar membership because you're getting twenty five right it's back paying for so. itself yeah, yeah and you know you're going to get six issues of Turkey Country mm-hmm. a year and Turkey Country's uh, a very well done publication it's you'll find that it'll have I think something for everyone mm-hmm. uh, that that uh, appreciates the outdoors mm-hmm. and um, you know I you know joining the flock here in new jersey obviously means a lot to to our team because now you're part of our team mm-hmm. and uh, i'll welcome you to the flock so uh, well, thank you awesome. very much awesome thank you thank you yeah and and thank you to all the listeners that have listened we want to make sure that we also thank Stephen marr again for our theme music thank you for contributing that uh you can follow us on twitter at pineland nursery facebook at pinelands nursery nj instagram at pinelands nursery YouTube and Pinelands Nursery also. And don't forget about our new Native Plants Healthy Planet Facebook uh, group as well. Yeah. Yeah. So you can listen to the Native Plants Healthy Planet podcast directly at www.nativeplantshealthyplanet.com. You can also listen to the podcast on Pod, Podbean, iTunes, Spotify, iHeartRadio, Google Play, Stitcher, TuneIn, YouTube, or you can just ask, ask uh, wow, that's a tongue twister, <laughs> ask Alexa to play the Native Plants Healthy Planet podcast. <laughs> so make sure you uh, follow us, like us, comment, leave a review. We really appreciate all those five-star reviews you've, you've been leaving. Um, all the feedback's really been great for us and, and keeping us motivated. So thanks again for joining us. I'm Tom. And I am Fran. Thanks again, everyone. We will see you next time. And until then, keep it native. Thank you for listening to the Native Plants Healthy Planted Podcast, presented by Pinelands Nursery. Remember to like, share, follow, and comment.